I summon Dark Magician in attack position. Dark Magician, attack his life points directly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strife Hayes. I've spent years playing the best MMO games available. Now it's time to do the opposite and find the worst of the worst. I'm going to play them all so you don't have to. Join me on a journey through the most awful MMOs I can find. Drop a like on the vid and sub to the channel for more awful MMOs and ring the bell so you don't miss a single video. A huge thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Twitch who make all my content possible. Links to both are below. Right, let's begin. Today we are playing Wizard 101. Now, I'd never played this before, even as a kid, and I've had lots of people recommending it to me, so I actually went into this one with pretty high expectations. First thing you notice is the main website is very, very colourful. This looks like something straight from the late 90s, early 2000s educational era. I'm getting very Legend of the Zumbinis vibes, but it's free, so let's make an account. Wizard 101 is all about magic and spells, so we have to choose whether we are a boy wizard or a girl wizard. This is a somewhat limited choice, guys, plus boy wizards wear blue and girl wizards wear pink. Not really pushing the boat out too much on this one, are we? Now for a name. Ah, right. This is one of those games, kind of like horse riding tales, where you can't actually choose your own name. You've got to create a name from a pre-selected bank of names. You've got your first name and then two surnames. This is a system used by companies to make sure no one ever makes anything rude and no one corrupts the virtue of its mostly child players. So I spend some time trying to make something rude, but I don't get too far. Eventually, I just settle with with Richard because it shortens to dick and that makes me chuckle. Next up we have to choose a wizard type which major element we are going to follow. You've got your standard magical schools like fire or ice or nature but you've also got myth or death. Oh yes let's do death necromancy all the way. So the username Josh Strife Hayes is taken because I honestly downloaded this before Christmas and signed up using a burner email, then I never got round to playing it and forgot the burner email, so I'm forced to go with Josh Strife Hayes 2. The game begins, we are thrown into the character creation system and a booming discount Dumbledore talks us through it. I find this really odd because all the choices we just made, like gender, name and wizard school, we have to make again, so there was no reason to choose anything earlier at all. This overlay is a mix of charming and nerdy nursery school levels of design. These overlay icons do look like they were drawn by a child, but they are super simple to understand for any language, so I've got to give the game props for being accessible. It's very easy to see what does what. And I mean, the customization isn't awful. You can change your hair, robes, eyes, hat, all the standard stuff you'd expect. I've played worse character creators. Now we meet Hedwig, I mean Gamma the Owl. She shouts some stuff at us, and then Not Dumbledore says some more things, and it becomes incredibly obvious that Gamma and Dumbledore are both very good voice actors using very different microphones. The audio quality between the voices in this game vary wildly. The actual quality of the voice actor is very, very good, as we'll hear, but the quality of the equipment used is just all over the shop. Character made, and we begin. Third person action adventure, wazzed movement, but A and D are not strafe. They are turn, which is a control scheme I hate. So I press escape to open the menu and remap the keys, and nope, pressing escape does not bring up any kind of menu. At least not at the start of the game, so there is no changing the keybinds. Chat to Gamma the Owl, you run up to NPCs and press X to interact which is an odd choice of key, but okay. She explains the basic plot, and again, voice acting is pretty damn good. Also, it started raining, and there's a storm happening, and the ambient sounds and general weather effects are fine. So we head over and inside this big magical tower. Inside, we meet the evilest man who has ever eviled. Look at this dude. This is the power of art direction. He doesn't need to say anything, and you know this guy is evil. His name is also Malastare, because subtlety is not this game's strong point. This is also the moment you really realise they definitely hired professional voice actors, because almost every voiced character in this game is brilliant. I mean, listen to how evil Malastare sounds. You are no longer welcome here. Why have you returned? I'm here to resolve our unfinished business. Is this your latest student? My henchmen will see to your little friend. Hurry along, young wizard. Take this deck of spill cards and deal with those creatures while I tend to Malistair himself. Don't be so sure of yourself, old man. Run up and confront them. Be brave. I will guide you. This is something we'll come back to often. Voice acting in Wizard 101 is 
top notch. And now the game really begins and we discover what Wizard 101 really is, because while it might look like an MMORPG, it's not. It's actually a card game. I was not expecting this at all. I came into this completely blind and I was just expecting a run-of-the-mill copy-paste MMO with small overworld sections and collect X or kill X quests, like Tale of Toast or Horse Riding Tales, but what I got was actually a really, really well-designed card game. So my geeky background is very card game heavy. I've played Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and I used to play Magic the Gathering at tournament level, so the moment I saw this, I was like, yes, tactical deck building and card games, let's do this! Then I remembered how much money I've spent on card games over the years and realised, ah, right, I can see where this is going to go to. Anyway, let's look at the card game itself. The arena is divided into eight positioning circles, split into four versus four. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, you just face a single enemy. Each turn, you draw a card and cast spells. Some spells hurt the enemy, some spells heal your own health, some will power up your next attack. Casting spells requires pips, and you gain a pip every turn, so not casting a spell on a turn lets you save your pips up for better spells. It's like Magic's land system. Casting a spell makes the animation of the spell play through, and and you get to watch the damage being done, and these animations are good. Seriously, they're not too long, they're just detailed enough, they're chunky and stylized, they are a pleasure to watch. They don't slow the game down too much while adding real character and depth to each spell. I like this, a lot actually. In the bottom left you can see your HP in red and mana, which is your spellcasting power, in blue because Diablo mastered this system many years ago and no one has ever seen any reason to differ from it. There's even a freaking unicorn spell that gives me health back. Yes, unicorn, stab me with your magical health-giving horn. Some spells apply buffs to your next attack of a certain element, or debuffs to an enemy's next attack against you, meaning stacking spells upon spells is a legitimate tactic. And good lord, look at this slow-mo centaur arrow animation. That's cool. And then there's these three little pigs, but they're ninjas. Three ninja pigs. That is the sign of a good game. Look, honestly, within five minutes of actually playing this card game, I was enjoying it. There's a balanced resource system that slowly gets more complex over time, damage, healing and effect cards, and slick animations to go with each one. So far, this plays better than Pokemon. Come at me, fanboys. I meant what I said. One of the best parts of this card game is it embraces an aspect that you can't do with paper card games. It allows some variation within damage on the cards. So a specific attack might do between 40 to 50 damage. This isn't possible in paper as it would involve too many dice, but in a PC game the calculations are all done for you. So Wizard 101 is actually allowing very slight element of tactical randomness within a defined range. This change means it stands out from other card games. It's still tactical, but you need to choose between an attack that might kill the enemy, or one that definitely will kill the the enemy and balance that choice with what card you'd rather have later. I win the first fight because, I mean, it's scripted and you can't lose, and now I try to chat, but ah, it's mostly canned chat for the young kids. That's understandable. Not Dumbledore now tells us we did so well defeating Malastare, this must mean we have a special destiny ahead of us. My god, I hope it involves casting Exodia. Now we begin the game proper, and the first surprising thing is how many other players there are around. Even in the starting zone, this is more populated than most games. I've played on this series. As standard, a yellow exclamation mark above a character means there's a quest because unique design is hard and this quest sends us to stop the undead incursion in Unicorn Way. I mean, at least it's not killing rats. I'm still impressed by how every character, even seemingly minor side characters, are fully voiced. Oh, and picking up this piece of wood unlocks the crafting tutorial. I will try and look into this later if I have more time, but a quick glance around the menu shows me crafting probably involves combining stuff you pick up with other stuff to make things, probably potions or more cards for your deck. Pretty standard stuff. The spellbook is now also unlocked, which is how we navigate through every menu, and it's both surprisingly easy to navigate using the tabs on the side and remote remarkably detailed. Everything is chunky and easy to read, laid out nicely, and I imagine all the info you need about your cards and decks is in here. There's nothing wrong with this. I mean, it might be quite garish at first glance, but it's not technically bad. Oh, one aspect I do love is how if you open your quest journal, you can see all the quests you own, choose which one to track, and that affects the floating arrow at the bottom of the screen, and you can go back and reread all of the dialogue that's been in the quest so far. This is a super simple system that more games should have. And now I 
I get to marvel at the combat, or more specifically, how they've managed to integrate a turn-based battle system into a real-time world. You see, the maps in Wizard 101 aren't huge, there's no expansive overworld, the game is divided into smaller sections which are all essentially linear paths from A to B with battle circles placed along them. And when you bump into an enemy, you and the enemy will run to the nearest battle circle and begin a duel, but you can still see all the other players and enemies walking around in real time. But remember how there's four circles for players and four for enemies? If another player sees you involved in a duel, they can run into your battle circle and just join in. And if another enemy walks over, they'll be added to the opponents. Then each turn is chosen and all the spells are cast and the battle just kind of goes from there. This, I have to be honest, is a brilliant system. You see, each enemy position has a symbol on the battle circle, so you can refer to the dagger enemy or the spiral enemy. And some player spells hit all the enemies, so you can always join in and help. Then after a fight is over, you'll appear transparent for a bit and be safe from any enemy attacks. Plus, in every single area, you can only be attacked in the middle of the road, and sticking to the paths around the side means you will avoid all fights. Once you're out of a fight, you've also got these red and blue floating orbs around the place that refill your health and your mana, so you can restock after a duel. We'll look at this system a bit more later on. For a first quest, we're told to report to a guard. Again, the voice acting is stellar, and they send us to chat to Saren. Then Olivia joins in. Seriously, they've got theatre standard actors for this. It is super good dialogue. Just listen. Oh, hey there, I'm Saren. You're new here, aren't you? Well, I for one am very glad you're here. Now we're given a map and wow, this is charming. This map might show how small and linear the instances are, but it also reminds me of those cartoonified theme park maps you'd get as a kid. With all the little drawings and stylized forests and rides on, this is very, very clearly aimed at children because all the aesthetics are pushing it toward child friendly. But it's got superb voice acting and a very well-made card game in it. So while it's aimed at kids in a very superficial aspect, it's not childlike in its mechanics or its technical presentation. The card game itself so far seems solid. More tutorials explains main quests shown by a star and side quests. Now to MMO vets, we know the difference, but the game is taking steps to make sure anyone new to the genre understands exactly what's going on. And as someone who makes tutorials, I can appreciate the attention to detail they are doing here. First glitch now, and I get dragged halfway across the map and thrown into combat like I was summoned from streets away to get involved in this specific battle. You know what? Oh well, the actual group combat works fine, so I don't really mind it as long as this glitch doesn't happen again. Follow the quest through, which is done by just following the arrow to the bottom of the screen and fighting whatever I need to fight or picking up X amount of objects. But unlike the how to train your dragon quest arrow, this one actually updates often and is pretty accurate. For now. Completing the first quest gets me my first item, a ring. Items can have health or mana or damage bonuses to certain magical elements on them. There is nothing too groundbreaking here, but it's easy enough for kids to follow and varied enough that tactics might eventually matter. Head back to Saren and let them know we've done a few quests. And again, I really enjoy the dry wit and the sarcasm in the voice acting. Oh wow, you made it back. The pirates warned about a rattle in the darkness? See, this is what I was talking about. Pirates are always creepy and frustratingly vague. What is clear is that some evil magic has emerged here, and we're going to need more than a handful of guards to stop it. The plot now takes us to find Lady Oriel, who is apparently the head of fairies and hiding in the hedge maze at the end of the map. So I run to the end of the map. Very, very linear and very, very small, but thankfully you can stick to the paths and avoid combat if you want to. This, however, is the worst hedge maze I've ever seen. This is crap. It's not even a maze, it's just an elaborate hedge cut into a pattern. There's no entrances or exits. I have a very high tolerance for children's games taking liberties with design, but to call this a hedge maze is just wrong. What you have here is some hedge. The Fairy Queen lets us know that the good fairies have been corrupted and we need to save them by breaking the bone cages set up along the street, then fighting some corrupted fairies and gathering fairy dust. 
Translation, interact with some objects and win some card games. They've not really gone too far from the established MMO quest convention here. Quests aren't really quests, they're just repetitive tasks. Then I hear what sounds like a rubber duck and yep, someone rides past me on a rubber duck mount. Oh good, it's nice to know the game will sell out the wizardy aesthetic to push premium cash shop mounts. And oh, don't worry, we'll be looking at the cash shop later. I run back down the street, opening the bone cages and collecting fairy dust. A few times I run into and join fights that are halfway done, but it seems if you don't contribute enough, then you don't get any rewards for being there. So if you're just trying to power through a quest, it's kind of a waste of time. By now, I'm actually getting quite strong Pokemon Stadium vibes. So far as each fight is announced, we face each other, we call forth a monster, and we get to watch a cool animation play. The fights themselves are fun. Honestly, the actual combat is more fun than the connecting travel and game. More on this later. Do the quest, head back and bump into the first major graphical glitch where this fairy model appears twice and overlaps itself, resulting in this Lovecraftian monstrosity of wings and limbs. If this were an actual intentional enemy, it would be quite creepy, but it's not. Carry on with the quest and turns out the undead invasion is likely the doing of Rattlebones, the evil skeleton. So we go back to Seren again and they send us to a tower at the end of the path and we have to fight the first boss. Now every map plays out like this. Complete a load of smaller fetch quests within a given area, then fight the boss at the end, lather, rinse, repeat. Oh, and the boss seems to allow four players to enter at once, but I decide to go ahead and try and solo this. The fight itself is fine. Occasionally you, however, or the enemy will fail a spell and it will just say fizzle. This seems to be at random and it's very, very annoying in a game based around tactics. I can't think of a single card game or tactical game that has a chance of something just failing at random and anyone going, yes, this is a good, enjoyable, fun mechanic. Beat Rattlebones and pick up some evil book. And when we go back outside, the scenery has changed because the evil influence is gone. I like this. Visual storytelling, environmental changes based on narrative events. Good one, designers. Saren now tells us to go to the commons, which is the central hub players can all meet at. There is a quick teleport button to the bottom right, or we can just manually run there but first pressing Q opens the quest finder and not only shows us the quest we're currently on it also lets us locate any nearby quests so wherever you are in the world you'll always be able to find something to do I want to finish a few more things while I'm here so I set off to find Orion a guard friend of Connolly who needs to be rescued Orion is hiding in a house and wants us to go and kill Lady Black Hope apparently a powerful and scary lich and can we just take a second to admire this painting of a dog dressed as a naval admiral. That is fantastic. If I could furnish every house in every MMO I play with that picture, I would do. Back on the quest, the Lady Black Hope Tracker sends us to another tower because designing environments takes time, so once you've got one good tower, you may as well use it many, many times. And I'm getting very strong Tim Burton vibes from the character design here. Very corpse bride. Beat her pretty easy and head back to Ryan. He's thrilled to know she's dead. Let guard Connolly know, and he sends us off to another side quest to rescue somebody else. Look, when your gameplay mainly consists of turn-based card games, you don't really have that much scope for questing shenanigans. Every quest is defeat X amount of enemies or save someone by defeating a specific enemy. But anyway, off we go. The quest says I need to save Dorothy and she'll be easy to find because she's in the house with the lights on. But clearly the designers didn't read the quest text because all the houses have lights on. They are the same house model. I only know where to go because I can follow the quest arrow. Inside, Dorothy is surrounded by a tin man and a giant humanoid dog called Toto, who also happens to be dressed like an absolute gent. Oh no. I have a horrible feeling. I don't know why, but I just think it's only going to get more furry as we play. Look, these early quests are just busy work. Back and forth from place to place. There's nothing of note here. So once they're all handed in, we go off toward the commons. On my way, I spot this badger called Brandon Mistborn. This is the most obvious homage to a fantasy author I've so far seen. For anyone unsure, 
Brandon Sanderson writes the Mistborn fantasy series. Now, I didn't realise it at the time, but this game is actually packed with NPC references to other famous fantasy things. See how many you can spot if you play. Here's the first mechanical problem. Opening a shop with an NPC brings up the shop window, but pressing escape on my keyboard doesn't close the shop window. It only opens the game menu, which we now have access to, and pressing escape again closes the game menu, but leaves the shop interface up. Quick design note, pressing escape should exit it any in-game overlay the player has open. Now the commons is packed with players and I can't help but feel the fantasy wizard aesthetic is dulled somewhat by this giant mech suit. This seems overpowered. Anyway, I'm off to meet someone called Harold. And it seems Harold is a dog and the furry domination continues. Harold tells me to take the book I found to the headmaster but then he introduces me to treasure cards which are super powerful one-time use cards that can help me in battle. Which I need to either buy from the premium store or get through crafting using reagents that I buy from the premium store and I can see how this is going to go. Head over to the headmaster and let him know I've dealt with the incursion on Unicorn Way and I found this cool book. He thanks me and sends me to study some more. You'd think a young wizard would finish their training before taking on hordes of the undead but not here. Maybe this is more on the job training. We now learn about potions which can be used to refill our health or mana in battle and they refill themselves by playing mini games or distractions at the fun fair. Might do that later, might not, don't know. So this is the main city and it's really busy. It's so busy in fact that sometimes bodies just don't load and players are disembodied floating eyes and eyebrows drifting around just flat faces moving through a city. I'm sent to meet some more NPCs and this guy, Lincoln, looks suspiciously like the stork from the old Disney Robin Hood cartoon. Then we go along and meet all the teachers from all the specific schools and everyone looks like they've been ripped off from somewhere. Also, the dog is the same model as Toto earlier. In a nice storytelling touch, however, the death school is led by a young student because the previous professor blew himself and the school up. I go to the death school, or in a nice design touch, as the game says, the crater where the death school until recently used to be, and learn some more spells. Basically, you can learn spells from your own school for free to add to your deck, but you have to pay to learn spells from other schools. So you can build a deck of any cards you like, you're just limited to what you can afford in the early game. Oh, we also have a dorm room now, which is just player housing. I imagine you can kit this out quite nicely. There's also a bank chest in here too. Nothing wrong with this mechanically. The overlay graphics, especially the hand-drawn characters on the map or the menu screens, are really starting to remind me of the old Vimto-style TV adverts. Or Don Hertzfeldt's animation style, the creepy artist who made the My Spoon is Too Big video. So these are adorable, but also rather unsettling. Back to the headmaster after all of this, he sends me off to Old Town. Then we get some icons appear on the right, NPCs that want us to find and talk to them. One of them is a super suave Italian stallion. This is Diego, the PvP master. And he is so smooth, I am absolutely trying some PvP before this video finishes. There's also this NPC, a way too excited preteen girl who offers to show me around town and wanting to avoid appearing on any police watch lists, I decline and explore by myself instead. So the main city is big. It's also not all loaded onto one map and you have to travel between the various city sections. Now a seasoned player will know which part of the city contains what. But as a new player, I can see the icons for the map I'm on but have no way of knowing what's in any other part of the city. You have to actually go there for your map to update. One small technical issue. While traveling around, it again becomes super obvious just how many players this game still has. These zones while shared are as busy as they've ever been. There are people round every corner. My next few quests send me to talk to this guard who explains about pets, animal companions that will fight alongside you but also get tired and need feeding. Oh good, another system I need to keep track of and will no doubt be able to pay real money to improve. Then we go into this tower and battle Old Judd, the most voodoo punk looking Baron Samady ripoff Ever. While the character design in the game may be nice, it feels very derivative of characters that already exist. One great thing about fantasy is you can create your own stuff, game. You don't need to copy everything. Another issue with combat is if I'm the only person involved in the fight, you don't need the 30 second timer on my turn. I understand that in a public shared map, you need turn timers for matches to not drag, but when it's just me soloing a boss, 
let me take my time. Card games always have multiple lines of play and tactics matter, so let me make tactical choices. Also, let me read the damn cards. 30 seconds is not enough time for this. I know I can win these early fights by just clicking basically any spell, but you should start how you intend to go on and you should teach your players the value of time tactical choices. Oh, also we now have a pet, which cannot be manually named either and is given a randomly assigned name. Mine got Shaggy Beatrix, which is better than anything I could have come up with myself. Oh, and now you actually get to play as your pet, because you need to sneak through the bars on a gate and find a key to unlock a door which only the pet can fit through. This honestly doesn't add anything of value to the game. There is no unique gameplay element when you are the pet. It's just a small section of walk over here, now walk back over there. Nothing optimal opens up. Playing as an animal has a world of possibility and you've used absolutely none of it. Now a bit of humour here, and I love this. I have to admit the game's humour so far is absolutely my sense of humour. This bit actually made me laugh out loud. You need to crack a combination lock. So the wizard you're with tries 000 001, which doesn't work. So they try 000 002, which doesn't work and then they get annoyed and give up. So you as the pet go and talk to the animals in the tower to get the code. Turns out the code is 000 003. That actually made me laugh. The pet now has talents which are unique pet attacks that can help you in combat. However, using the pet's talents reduces the pet's happiness and you can refill the happiness by, have a guess, did you say paying real money? because you're right. Another graphical overlay glitch now. I leveled up the moment this dialogue box opened and the close the level up X is covered by the dialogue box which traps me in a conversation loop. Maybe you need to revisit how these UIs interact with each other game. Okay, by now I'm still having fun, but I'm beginning to see the flaws this game is going to have. There are so, so many systems now, it's getting a bit overwhelming. Remember when I reviewed League of Angels and it just throws everything at you at once? Well, Wizard 101 doesn't go as far as that, but it definitely has the same design principle. You have health and mana and cards and a second deck and one-time treasure cards and pips and pets and pet energy and food and resources and mounts and player housing. There's a lot of systems within systems here and I just know it's going to get to a point where they all hit a paywall. I am making this prediction right now. Before I finish this review, I will, without trying, hit some kind of paywall. Let's see if I'm right. I accept all the quests local to me and set off to complete as many as I can, mainly just by following the arrow and powering through them. Storm Street is in trouble for some reason, so we are heading there. You know, for a city full of powerful wizards and professors and brimming with guards, the undead sure have made a serious dent in city real estate. What is the point of having guards and powerful wizards if they are not going to stop an invasion? By now I'm beginning to understand the problems with this game. The actual card game, the core battling system, is good. It's not explained well enough to do justice to how good it is, actually. You never get shown what elements are on cards or how pips interact with each other or how to queue up spells. The mechanics of the system are sound, but the game just really doesn't show the strengths of it. Plus, honestly, the walking around bit, the traveling from place to place, that's the weakest bit of the game. This is a card game. It's a darn good card game. The bits in between the card games, they're quite boring. Now we meet Duncan. I like Duncan, he has a good sense of humour and the voice acting continues to be terrific. I played for a bit more and now it's just become really obvious how many buy systems are in this game. How many things you'll slowly run out of but be able to buy with real money. Want better equipment? Yeah, you can just earn it. Or you can buy it with premium currency of crowns. Or you can buy better pets, or cards, or booster packs, or reagents, or mounts, or more mana, or more item storage. There seems to be nothing in this game that isn't monetized. And just like any actual card game, more money means more victory. But forget the pay to win aspect for a moment and just look at this purely as a casual player. The best part, without a doubt, was joining the four player battles against multiple enemies. Healing your fellow players, discussing tactics, taking down groups of enemies. It did make the drop in and play style extremely accessible and the mid-level fights were really challenging and fun. The quests aren't anything to write home about. Travel along a linear path, kill enemies in a card game, find item, find more items, take them to people. You basically get the gameplay by now, and the PvE is just a series of story beats to move you from card game to card game. 
This is an on-rails adventure, it's just a decent card game on top of that. If I stopped following the main storyline, it's not like I could go and explore somewhere else or journey to another world, it's not a free-form MMO. It's a linear story with a card battling mechanic. Now, the main city is large for a city, but when you realise that's the main hub of the game, it becomes apparent that it's actually quite limiting. If this was a city and there was miles of wilderness around it to explore, then great, but that isn't the case here. This is where most of the game seems to be contained. Oh, and if you're in a fight and you want to flee, whether you're solo or in a group, you need to wait until it's your turn and choosing flee drains you of all your mana, meaning you can't get involved in any other fights until you refill and find the blue orbs floating around the side. So fleeing isn't a good idea. And in later areas, enemies seem to travel in larger groups, so aggroing one starts a fight against two or three. You have to hope someone decides to join in and help you. To like Wizard 101, you need to like turn-based card games, because that's the core mechanic. It just so happens that I do very much like turn-based card games. First bug with the direction arrow when the map you're on has two levels because it is never quite sure whether to point you toward the person or the teleporter that takes you close to the person and will switch between the two quite quickly. I do love how when collecting items from the side of the road I can just watch the other fights play out in real time and I can still see their animations. I feel if they were going to make a Pokemon MMO this is absolutely the system they should build on. Another message from Diego the Jewel Master pops up. He really wants to see me, so I will definitely go and find him as soon as I'm back in town. I get involved in some more fights and I try and look for some more areas I could improve in the game. The pips your player has are shown as orbs of light around your battle circle, but they really need to be numbered somewhere obvious on the screen. You see, it's a beautiful UI, but it's not always the most functional, and when playing a card game, function matters quite a lot. Kill the mobs, get the items, charge the magical MacGuffin, save Storm Street. Head back and talk to the NPCs, it's all kind of the same to be honest. Seems that young Susie was attacked by the Harvest Lord in Galvanost Tower and because the game has worked out that the travel is boring and the fights are fun, you can now just use a teleporter to go straight there. It's another boss tower, which again, I'm gonna try and just solo. The tactical part of this game is good. I need to actually heal myself in this fight and power up some spells or save some pips. This isn't just a mindless steamroll victory, although I hate when a spell fizzles. Random 100% failure shouldn't happen in a tactical decision based game. So I win, and this time I get a loot chest which gives me some cool boots, and then I'm asked if I want to spend 50 crowns to roll again and get even more loot. Oh, pay to win, here we go. Well, I've got some free crowns, so I re-roll, I get the same boots. Again. So. Let's examine the crown store. I click buy crowns and the game freezes. Wow. This is the first time I've ever played a game where the in-game cash store wasn't the most optimised thing ever. But while you're on the website, check this out. You can earn free crowns by taking trivia tests. You see, Wizard 101 is aimed at kids and it seems they do actually value education somewhat. So instead of just buying currency, you can instead choose to take multiple choice tests and earn some in-game crowns. The available tests cover a range of topics from maths to literature, history or geography, and if you do well, you get currency. I can't fault this, you're rewarding kids for learning stuff. Good on you, Wizard 101. Well, I'm a grown adult. I think I'm quite smart. So I'll take the colours test, because I'm pretty confident I know what colours are. What? I, um, I have never even heard half these words they're asking me the meaning of. I mean, I'm not even sure if half these words are real. So, needless to say, I did not do very well on the colours test, and I earned no crowns. You know what? Doesn't matter, because at least I've got those boots from the chest, which I can't equip because they're for ice school wizards only. Fantastic. Not only did I pay for a loot reroll, but both bits of loot I got are useless. Thank you, Wizard 101. Go back and talk to Susie about the whole problem with Storm Street. She says it's the Tempest Nexus. Well, of course it is, Susie. It's always the Tempest Nexus. God, come on, get it together. Then Christmas happened in real life, so I get to log out, enjoy a few days of not playing this, and then log back in. Now, the moment you log back in, as with all Almost any free MMO, you are shown an advert for the cash shop. 
So let's give this a quick glance over. The premium currency is crowns. You can also see on the shop screen we have some recommended items for our level. So I wonder how much they'd cost us. This candied ram mount is 7,500 crowns. The cheapest way to get that would be $10 and $5 of crowns. So a $15 mount. That's standard for most bigger MMOs to be fair. But here's a feature I really respect they actually show you the conversion rate of money you are spending to crowns you are getting. So as you buy more, you know what kind of deal you're getting. That's a classy move. I like that. Now, crowns can buy just about everything in the game. Cards, card packs, boosters, mounts, pets, even just straight up gold. Elixirs or potion boosts, cosmetic overrides, just everything. Also, this Overlord costume looks exactly like M. Bison from the Street Fighter movie, so it's the only thing I'd completely consider buying. You can buy better houses or crafting reagents or recipes. Look, this is the perfect example of pay to win. There is nothing in this game you can't improve with money because the core game mechanic is card game. I know from experience that spending more money on a deck means you win more. I play Jund in modern for God's sake. Anyway, I go and find Susie, she explains the Nexus is unstable and sends us to Baelstrom. We now get shown the mark and return function, which is an amazing system that should be in every game ever. You are allowed to mark where you are, then later you can spend a small amount of mana to return to wherever you marked. This deletes the mark, so you can now go and mark somewhere else. This saves so much time. And because you can only set one mark, it's also a strategic choice. This is a good system. Use this more, games. Back to the commons we go, and we're off to the Storm School, because they know a thing or two about Tempest Nexuses. To fix up the Nexus, rescue Susie, and save the street, we need an item, and all that happens in about five minutes just by clicking. There is amazingly no card games needed. Starts raining in the game, and the rain graphics aren't awful, so we continue on with more linear quests. Talk to a person, defeat enemies in a card game, talk to another person, repeat. I want to find the PvP, but as I don't know the map, I ask around, and to the community's credit, they're actually pretty quick at replying. I need to go to Unicorn Way. I know I've said this twice, but the amount of players in Wizard 101 is still impressive, and will be even more impressive when we see the PvP room. Clearly, the core mechanic of card game is decent enough to keep people around, and the added extras of fishing, crafting, or minigames are just the cherry on top. Finally find Diego, the Italian stallion, and he shows me the PvP arena, and it is packed. So PvP is basically 1v1 battles, but there's ranked and practice mode. PvP seasons are called Ages, and the winner of a certain age gets some cool stuff. So I queue up for a one-on-one -on -one PvP practice battle, and the game tells me it's searching for someone of my skill level. So I'm expecting to fight another brand new player. I've been in the game about seven hours so far, and I haven't spent any money, so clearly it knows I'm not that powerful. It finds me a match, we begin, and... right. You see, I have a few hundred hit points, and this guy has five thousand. My attacks are doing absolutely nothing to him. But to his credit, this guy does ask me if I need some help and offers to go questing with me to help get me some better equipment. If you're watching this Kevin Dragonheart, you are an absolute gent. Kevin and I chat for a bit, trying our best to get around the incredibly restrictive chat filter. You can type what you like, but so, so many words are filtered. Eventually, he ends the duel by just smacking me for 24,000 damage. Back to the main square, and it's alive and well. This game seems to have a solid community. I spend some time chatting in the main plaza, and people seem nice enough to reply. You could pick a worse community, to be honest. And now it happens, what I predicted earlier. I accept a quest that needs me to go to Cyclops Alley. So I follow the arrow, and... Nope. Cyclops Alley is a premium area. I need to either buy the area, or be a monthly member to go here. Here is the paywall I predicted we'd run into. It's either going to cost me 750 crowns or to have a monthly membership to access here. Now, I don't have any problem with games having paid for areas or monthly fees. Elder Scrolls Online does it, and that's one of my favourite MMOs. My problem is with the fact the game still gave me the quest and still let me accept it. There was nothing to tell me, oh, by the way, this is a member's quest. It lets you start the adventure and then blocks you instead of telling you at the start. I decided to just return to doing what quests I can, working my way through my quest logs, switching quests to other quests, focusing on those, sometimes fleeing, sometimes draining my mana, collecting blue orbs. 
I join a few more team battles, but honestly, they're a really enjoyable system. They are like a break from the rest of the game. I like getting involved, I like helping, I like knowing we're working as a team, and I'm dead. So when you die, other team members can heal you, or you can just sit there watching the fight taking up a space. I know that I'm taking up a space another more alive player could have, but there's no one else around, so I just sit there and watch these guys take the enemies down. Now after about 8 hours, there is a major difficulty spike. Up until now, I've been able to solo everything and one with some basic tactics, but now on this street, enemies are so much more powerful. They are hitting harder, and you basically need a team. Progress is suddenly a lot slower. It's at this moment the game really encourages you to buy card packs. There's also some random camera jerking which is quite jarring, so I need to quest to get better. So my next quest takes me to Firecat Alley. So I go there and nope, another premium area. That's two and that's annoyed me. Having premium areas is fine. Sneaking them in like this is not. This is the same thing that How to Train Your Dragon did. You see, when you accept a quest, there's nothing to tell you it's a premium quest. There's nothing in your quest journal that even suggests it might be premium. Every quest in the journal looks the same. Every map area link looks the same. The only way you know part of the game is premium is when you actually try to go there. And for most kids, by then, they'd have invested time and energy into the quest and want to carry on. I find this practice of giving someone a quest they will eventually have to pay to finish quite predatory. Anyway, I'm eight hours in by now, and honestly, I've not had the worst time. Wizard 101 is basically a card game. Yeah, there are some MMO elements like quest and equipment and a very loose storyline and potions and leveling up and minigames, but if you strip away the excess, what you have is a four versus four turn-based card game. And as a card game, it's honestly not bad. The large selection of cards, the various schools, the range of potential damage on a certain card, the teamwork element, even the animations are really good. Playing the card game part is fun if you like card games. But it is a card game, which means it's going to become pay to win eventually. And there's a lot of monetized systems here. And while they aren't bad themselves, like pets or mounts or housing or mana, they can all be paid for. The act of having premium stuff or membership just sneaks up on you. It will get very expensive, and it sucks. So Wizard 101 wasn't awful as a game, but does have some really questionable monetization tactics and clearly favors those willing to spend a lot of money. It's a card game with a rather large community and is definitely child friendly, but I feel once you've played, you'd eventually outgrow it and you'd progress to other more established and better games. Which is why the final rating for Wizard 101 is Yu-Gi-Oh! out of 10. Cheers for watching. If you want more worst MMO ever videos, then drop a like or sub to the channel. A massive thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Twitch who make all my content possible. If you're enjoying the series and would like more, you can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Comment down below with any game you want me to play next, then check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and Discord. And as always, have a great day.